Levi, you're not supposed to stay down there now. You know, cookies down there are going to get. <laughs> okay, Ephesians 1 and 2 Timothy 2. Okay, I want to give you this morning uh, the basic approach to the Bible or how to get the right interpretation of the Bible. How is it that you have all these different various ideas, denominations, viewpoints from one book? Okay, and um, there's a reason for that. And so 2 Timothy and then Ephesians 1 gives the proper approach to understand the words rightly divided. Okay, God has chosen in this age to limit himself to written words. I don't know if you realize the chance that he's taken by doing that. Have you ever written somebody a letter and they totally did not see it the way you thought it? Written words can be interpreted by the reader to be totally opposite of what the writer intended. And often it's the spirit or the sincerity of the reader or lack thereof, may distort the words. And so God has done that. He's done that on purpose. And that's his intention to to understand a person's heart. So Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 and verse 3, we'll start reading down. There are two theological systems that that, that place the roots in Ephesians 1. Unfortunately, uh, they're both um, can be abused, taking a truth out of the way. Let's go ahead and pray first. Lord, I do ask you to enlighten our eyes, help us understand the scriptures, help us understand the proper approach to the Bible, and that we might, when we read through these words, that we might know what applies or what you want us to act upon and or believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, With all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Okay? Now, Calvinism is a belief system. And they're going to try to use verse 4 and 5 for this system. And the system is basically that God chooses who's going to go to heaven and who's not. They leave that decision to God when the choice is yours or mine. So in verse 4, they read it this way, As he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now the Calvinists will accent upon, on, accent upon us. He's chosen us. The Bible believer would accent upon in him. Why? Because him, Jesus Christ, was before the foundation of the world. Us were not. So they got, it. They got that cattywampus. So, as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Having predestinated, you see the word destinated or destination, predestinated. So, he says that God predestinates people to go to heaven or to go to hell. But that's not true. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation. Now there's another group right there, a theological system called dispensationalist. Now a person can take that to extreme and become a hyper-dispensationalist. Now, that, that's a big word, that in a dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Okay, now, th- notice the word dispense, dispensation, and then it says, in the fullness of times. Now, most that hold to this viewpoint will use time periods. And people that don't, uh, they see a flaw in the time periods, unfortunately when they point out the flaw, which I agree with, but they throw out the whole system out, which I don't agree with. I mean, if you have something wrong with your car, do you throw the whole car away? 
You fix the flaw. Right? You fix the flaw. Now, if it's got a, too many flaws, then you do want to throw the whole car away. Okay, but these people try to justify themselves by saying this is wrong in this viewpoint of dispensations. Therefore, we're going to throw the whole thing out. But yet they'll drive a car that has a flaw, get the flaw fixed, and keep the car. That's inconsistent. All we need to do is fix the flaw. Now, the idea of dispensation of the fullness of times, you can see in this verse, it seems to give credence to the idea of a time periods. But we need to read all the times the word dispensation is found in the Bible. It's found four times. So we are in this process going to read through all of them. So this gives us a proper approach to the Bible. The proper approach to the Bible is covenants and doctrine. That gives the proper approach to the Bible. Not time periods. Covenant and doctrines. Now the devil is so subtle, subtle is that he can use a truth at a wrong time and the truth becomes an error. Timing is so important. It's so important that God put in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the first 12 verses is all about timing. Time to die, time to live, time of war, time of peace. Timing is very important. Anybody that works on engines knows that timing works. Brent didn't have a car for a month, didn't have the part for the car down there in Costa Rica. Why? It jumped time. And he needed parts for that. If the engine jumps time, the only way it's running is if you push it running fast. It's the only way it's running. Now, it can be off time and still run, but it will run rough. <clears throat> Timing is very important. Like in football, in high school football, the quarterback can make eye contact with the receiver, throw the ball, and the guy catch it. That do not work in college and the pros. In the college and the pros, that receiver is running the route, and the quarterback has released the ball, and the guy hasn't even looked at it when he turns it gets to the spot where the ball is intended to be, then he catches the ball. It's timing. It has to be so precise. Same as in basketball. In basketball, the guy will catch the ball, get his feet in order, you know, and then he'll fire up and shoot. That don't work in college or pros. They get their feet, <clears throat> as that ball is coming, their feet are in position to shoot. Boom! It's up like that quick. Split, split second. Timing is true in the Bible also. A Jehovah Witness is knocking on doors and telling people something true about the kingdom. Their timing's off. The timing's off, which makes it a lie. That's how subtle the devil is. So there are proper <coughs> interpretations of the Bible. But proper interpretations of the Bible is like proper nutrition. You can eat the proper nutrition, but if your body doesn't assimilate what you're eating, it is of no value. It just goes through you. Okay, a lot of times, like for in um, Australia, we went to this one guy and he said we were low on zinc. And Heidi says, I take all these zinc tablets. She was taking the zinc tablets, but her body was not assimilating the, tab the zinc. So he made of frequency things where her body can assimilate. Drinking water, okay, distilled water, fine and dandy, maybe throw in some minerals in there, but what helps your body retain the water is salt, Himalayan salt. Farmers will have a salt lick for cattle that does, you know, one is to assimilate the water, but also to create a thirst for the water. Okay, the same is true for us. The same is true in the Bible. You got all these people reading the Bible, but they're not assimilating it properly in their spiritual life because they're not interpreting according to what the Bible says. Now, the idea of dispensation, when I, I was raised Dutch Reformed down in Demont, and at the age of 12, 11 or 12, my parents helped start Community Bible Church. And the Community Bible Church in those days was dispensational. And Clarence Larkin had a book, man, as a kid, I thought, man, that's cool, I like that. You visualize things in the Bible. Now, people that see that and don't like the idea will notice the flaw and throw the th whole thing out. Why can't you just fix the flaw? 
Okay, and so in this process, uh, I'll read a, see a book title says something against dispensation, something that I believe I like to read it. And what they're going to do is they're going to point out the flaw, but then they throw it all out. I don't do that. Fix the flaw. And then you get the right interpretations. So I'm going to give you some thoughts on biblical dispensations in the Bible. And the first thought is this. The main criticism against the idea is dividing by time periods. Now in Ephesians 1, which we read in verse 10, it seems that time periods is part of it. Verse 1. Okay, now that is a flaw. Now, some folks that usually when they go on a diatribe against something, they'll point out people who are proponents of it. They'll point out something in their lives that was wrong. But that's not dealing with the issue. That's dealing with a person. Ignore the personalities. What these people were saying who are against dispensations, it was first developed by John Darby in the 1800s. <clears throat> I beg to differ. Okay, but they still say that. And the ones that made it popular for the church was... Clarence Slarkin and C.I. Schofield. Now, Clarence Larkin and C.I. Schofield, God used to give this proper interpretation of the Bible, but C.I. Schofield and Clarence, especially C.I. Schofield, had many personal issues, and both men were not Bible believers. Both men would go to new Bibles at times. <clears throat> but, God still uses these men. You see, God does not wait for all of us to be perfect to be using us. Which, he wouldn't have anybody to use. And so he used C.I. Schofield and Clarence Larkin, and the Protestant church, or the churches, in the 1800s and in the 1900s, the vast majority approached the Bible from this method. There's a guy in line up, uh, Oklahoma farmer. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name. <clears throat> you might find him online. Les Feldick. That uses this method and teaches a, mostly just country folk. And he does use this method, which is a good method, but it's got a flaw. Okay, and the flaw is, now here's how they teach it. <clears throat> that there are seven time periods of the Bible. You have innocence. That's Garden of Eden. Okay, after innocence, you have conscience. That was with Adam and Eve and following. Then you have government. Then you have promise. Government would be under Noah. Then you have promise under Abraham. Then you have the law, Moses. Now that one there can be put in a time period. <clears throat> then you have grace. So they talk about this idea called the dispensation of grace. Sometimes you'll find some of these folks in the radio. Okay, now the problem with that is that they limit grace to the New Testament where grace is in the Old Testament. So that is a problem. Okay, we'll correct the problem. And then the last one of the seven is kingdom. Now I believe that those seven and that time period is a good starter. Okay, that's the training wheels on the bicycle. Now eventually you want to take the training wheels off. Those motorcycles, those Harleys, that has got, you know, tricycles, Harley. That's just training wheels. They need two wheels, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, but <clears throat> eventually you need the training wheels off. So a person can take the beginning, the seven time periods, and correct it, and then get solid interpretations throughout the Bible. Okay, so the unfortunate thing is these people will throw the whole thing out. And that's just because they're trying to justify themselves. Now, who started this idea of rightly dividing the word of truth? That's 2 Timothy. I don't think I read that. 2 Timothy. <clears throat> now, Paul advised Timothy this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, where he says in verse... Uh, 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun <clears throat> profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. For their word 
will eat at thus a canker, we would say cancer, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. So he happened to name two guys. Who concerning the truth have erred. How did they err? They erred by failing to rightly divide. Okay, that's how they erred. <clears throat> Saying the resurrection is past already. No, it's not. And overthrow the faith of some. Confuse people. So, now the Apostle Peter, if you would try 2 Peter chapter 3. He mentions another fella who wrote some things in the Bible. <clears throat> Paul. Now it's interesting that he wrote about Paul because Paul chewed him out in Galatians 2. Peter's wrong about some things and Paul, he kind of put it on him. But Peter was a man who accepted the truth. The Lord chewed Peter out on several occasions too. And he said this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. An account, to be the long, an account that the long suffering of our, of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul. Notice he did not hold that chewing out. You know, he, he probably said, I had that coming. <clears throat> also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles. Okay, so in your Bible that will be Romans. First and Corinthians, Galatians, if he all the way through Philemon. Okay, now possibly Hebrews by Paul, I, I would believe that, but he doesn't put his name at the beginning of that one. So they're going to have a problem with Paul's writings. What are they going to do with them? Verse sixty: Speaking in them things which in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest wrestle with. As they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. Okay, so that tells us, by the Apostle Peter, we need to pay attention to what Paul's got to say. Okay, so who started this idea of rightly dividing the Bible? John Darby? No, it was the Lord Jesus Christ did. The Lord started it. <clears throat> and I'll just cite the reference. If you would, go to Isaiah 61. Okay, in Luke chapter 4, the, the devil tempted Jesus Christ. The temptations were not sin per se. What they were, they were truths about the second coming. He was trying to get the devil, or Jesus, <clears throat> to jump into the second coming without fulfilling the first coming. Okay, and then <clears throat> the first public message Jesus Christ delivers in Nazareth, his hometown... He asked for a book of Isaiah, <clears throat> so they, they took uh, the, the book of Isaiah and put it in a book form. And he, he uh, found the scripture where, where you have Isaiah 61. <clears throat> okay, and he read the entire verse 1. We have advantage of chapter and verse markings. And then in verse 2, he read up into the comma to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma. Now, we see the punctuation, or the, the sentence keeps going. But Jesus stopped at the comma, closed the book, <clears throat> and he said, This day is a scripture fulfilled. Now, if he would have completed the sentence, And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, and then the entire verse 3. <clears throat> if he would have completed that, he could not say, this day is the scripture fulfilled. Because the word vengeance is the second coming. In this verse, you split the first and second coming by 2,000 years at a comma. The Bible will do that at a comma, a conjunction, and a semicolon or a colon. There's about 10 places that I could show you that. 2,000 year gap. Who started that? Jesus Christ did. So he's the originator. <clears throat> the second thought is this. The originator of rightly dividing the word of truth is the Lord Jesus Christ, not John Darby. Okay? Third idea. What is the biblical definition of dispensation? Okay, now how do we know it's not time period? I want to go back to that. If you would look in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. And then the cross-reference, Colossians chapter 1. 
Okay, Ephesians and Colossians, they're two separate churches, and Paul wrote some similar ideas to both churches. Okay, now remember that dispensationalists will try to limit the dispensations to a certain period of time. Ephesians 3, verse 2, it says, <clears throat> If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Now, right there, they would say, Okay, see, look at there. The dispensation of grace. That's the New Testament. Okay, and you can see how that works. And if you throw in the other passage, okay, you can see how that's justified. <clears throat> but look at the cross-reference. Colossians. So it's two letters later. You will see that the verses are parallel. They are parallel. Colossians 1.25 Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. So there's that which is given to me, with, to me, same as Ephesians. But notice, if we limit the word dispensation as a time period, Colossians one twenty five says dispensation of God. I didn't know there was a time period of God. So that should put a monkey wrench in our definition or cause us to rethink it. There's, a, there's not a time period called God. Hence, there's not a time period called grace either. Hence, dispensations are not limited to time periods. So what's the answer? Go, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and we find the answer. This is the first occurrence of the word in the Bible. And there is a rule of thumb that when a, a word shows up in a Bible, first, that basically gives its definition. Now, a lot of times when we see a big word in English, if you look inside the word, you get the definition. Okay, when I was, a lot of times something is so simple, we overlook the simple. I mean, when growing up on a farm, Dad and Ronnie would be working on We'd be working on a piece of equipment. Dad would tell me, run to the barn and get that wrench. Get the 916 wrench. That's the most popular, 916 half-inch wrench, most popular wrench. And so I'd go in there, and we'd have the wrenches hanging on the wall, and I'd go in there, and the 916, since you use it so much, is never where it's supposed to be. So it wasn't where it's supposed to be, so I'm looking high, looking low, looking high, looking, looking over there, looking over there, and I'd run back to Dad and say, I can't find it. And so he would get up, walk to the barn, and there it was sitting right on the bench. Right in front of me. Now I had wrench in my mind so much growing up that when I, we came across to sing the song that Jesus saved a wretch like me, I thought that said wrench for a long time. Okay, but how is it that you always overlook something so simple? Dispensation. What is that? Well, you go to the bathroom and there's a paper towel dispenser, right? Okay, so 1 Corinthians 9, 17, 9, 17, Paul said this, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel was committed unto me. A dispensing of the gospel. See how simple that is. To dispense means to distribute, to weigh out, to give out. A paper towel dispenser, a soap dispenser, dispenses soap. In the Bible, dispensing, here, dispensation of the gospel, the proper biblical term is, the definition of dispensation is the dispensing of an agreement or covenant. Okay, we live by covenant. We all do. We live by agreements. When you walk into a grocery store, it is an understood agreement that you will walk through the store peaceably, grab items off the thing, put in your shopping cart, and you will go to the cashier, and you, you value the goods more than the currency. They value the currency more than the goods. Quid pro quo, something for something. I know the millennials want nothing for something for nothing nowadays. And both parties say thank you. That is an honest exchange. 
If you walk into the store and you violate the contract, the quid pro quo, and try to get something for nothing, a five-finger discount. Okay, when we were in Australia, we were going through all these, and I saw this 70-year-old man, and he walked by the two chocolate bars there, and when I was walking by, he was going like this, and he saw me looking at him, and so I thought, oh, that booger's going to stick down in his pocket. So I walked on like I didn't see him, and I watched him out of my peripheral like this, and then he got him in his pocket. And so I'm being an investigator. So I'm watching him meander through the store like he's going to buy some other things. He put some things in his cart, but I can see his shorts. There's them two candy bars sitting in there. He violated the agreement. Quid pro quo, something for something. He wanted something for nothing. So when we got up to the front to complete our agreement, and I said thank you, they said thank you, and I said, hey, I saw a guy stick a couple candy bars in his pocket. And the kids, who was that? And so I'm looking down the aisle and I said, right over there. See, right over there. The old guy, he's got that big, bright, uh, yellow outfit on. That's the guy. Thank you so much. So they, when that guy got up to the front, he had his items on the cart. Okay, and they, he paid for his items. And he's walking out. When he's walking out, they nabbed him. You don't nab him in the store because he could say, Oh, I did not ask for God. I was going to put you in here. This guy was slick. Where he pulled him out of his pocket when he got out of the store and threw him in his cart. So if they said, What's in your pocket? He could say nothing. So they nabbed him. What did he do? He violated the contract. He breached the contract. Okay, so God works with us the same way. And dispensation is the dispensing of a contract and agreement. Okay, anybody, anybody who picks up a Bible, okay, you pick up a Bible, and if you get about two-thirds into it, you're going to see, voila, New Testament. There's a division. The Bible has two major parts to it, Old Testament, New Testament. It's a division. And back in, in the Exodus, it's called the book of, of the covenant. Hence, the Bible works by covenants. And so in Hebrews 8, it says that the New Testament is better than the Old Testament. Now, if a person doesn't accept that, you can't deal with them. Ronnie was talking to a guy at a farm show or a farm meeting or something, and this guy is trying to get him to obey the Sabbath and all that stuff. So he said, Dave, you got to write this guy. So we wrote back and forth. It took a couple of years. Harvest, planting, harvest, back and forth. And I'm, I'm telling him, God just simply made adjustments. That's all he did. You don't throw your cultivator out because it's out of adjustment. You adjust it. Well, he tore that page out of the Bible, New Testament. Who well, I don't believe that. Oh, so you're obeying all the Sabbaths. I mean, we went back and forth, back and forth a long time. I'm using all these farm illustrations. And finally, I said, okay, you obey the Sabbath. Wonderful. Do you set aside your land every seven years? That's the Sabbath. He said, no, but I want to. Oh, if that's good enough for you. And then I said, okay, then I obey all the Sabbath because I want to. He was failing on rightly dividing the Bible. He wasn't honest. Obviously, in the Old Testament, was a day of the week that they set aside for worship. The Sabbath. We call it Saturday. In the Bible, it's called the seventh day of the week, or the Sabbath. In the New Testament, it's Sunday. I say the Catholics changed that. No, they didn't. God changed that in Acts chapter 2. And that's why those people changed it. In Acts 20, verse 7, they met on the first day of the week. They didn't call it Sunday. The names of the days of our week are pagan names. Now, I'm not saying that you should tell somebody, have your schedule say, oh, you're going to meet with me the third day of the week. Uh, put Wednesday in there. <laughs> okay? But everyone who reads the Bible sees there's two covenants. Start there. That's your point of agreement. Then you can branch out to the seven covenants. There are seven agreements. Garden of Eden. Adam, 
the covenant with Adam is still in force. You have to work by the sweat of your brow. Ladies, you still give birth by sorrow. And change that. The covenant with Noah is about the division of the races. That has not changed. The covenant with Abraham, that was with him and his descendant, went from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. The Muslims are still upset about that. Then the covenant with Moses, that one is a national covenant. That one you can put in a time period. That's the only one of them. And then the one with David, that's called the sure mercy of David. And then there's a new one mentioned in Hebrew. Those are the seven covenants of the Bible. I'm not concerned about a covenant. A covenant is our term for contract. There's another word that's similar to that, and that's where the Bible has testament. A covenant is an agreement between two or more parties. It don't have to be related. A testament is usually the testator, the one who writes the last will and testament, who has their desires for the people, usually family, but a person can be disinherited. One of Brent's um, people that he mowed for years in the past, an elderly lady, she got mad at her son, and she said, I'm taking him out of my will, and I'm putting you in. And he got a couple thousand bucks out of that. I thought he was going to get a house cat or something, but he did get something out of it. That's a, an agreement. Okay? And so, everyone who reads the Bible recognizes there's two testaments. Basically, the Old Testament is emphasizing doing. And the New Testament is emphasizing being. Because you can do something and not be what you ought to be. But if you are what you ought to be, then you will do what God wants you to do. So in the Old Testament, it seems to work from the outside in. In the New Testament, it works from the inside out. That's oversimplistic, but that's the basic idea of it. Now, the last thing I also point out is, if you would look at 1 Corinthians 10.32. Now, we all do this. It's so simple. It's so simple. I don't know how to see how people miss it. When you go to the mailbox, you get some envelopes out of the mailbox, you subconsciously look, is it addressed to me? Who's it from? You have to do the same with the Bible. The Bible is written to three groups of people. 1 Corinthians 10.32 gives the three groups. Neither give offense. Okay? And it says, neither to the Jew, nor to the Gentile, nor to the church of God. Now, when God looks down from heaven... And if he sees an individual, and if he sees a Jew in this age, that person is lost. If God looks from heaven and he looks at an individual and he sees a Gentile, that person is lost. They're not saved. And when he looks at a Jew or a Gentile who is saved, he sees the church of God. That's a different group. And Paul is the main apostle of the church of God. If you would look in Galatians chapter 2. So, when you read through your Bible, you've got to ask, who's talking to him? Is he talking? A lot of people say, well, I do what Jesus does. No, you don't. No, you don't. I obey, obey the certain amount. No, you don't. If you're going to be adamant about it, I'm going to ask you for 50 bucks. Because Acts in Matthew 5, 42 says, give unto them that ask us of thee. Well, you, I'm not going to. Well, then you don't obey the Sermon on the Mount. I've had, I've had, I got some money out of that one. So, but Jesus' ministry, he said it to the apostles. We are going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You say, what about the Samaritan woman? Yeah, I know the Samaritan and the Gentiles were on the side. Primarily, he went to the Jews. Secondarily, by chance, through life, Gentiles. Paul, God switched Paul around. He said, Paul, you go to the Gentiles. And then, secondarily, Jews. Now, when you read through your Bible, there are three guys, Galatians 2.9, who were apostles to the circumcision. That's the Jews. Galatians 2.9. This is the agreement they come up with. 
It says, in, and when James, Cephas, and John. Cephas is another name for Peter. Simon, Peter, Cephas, you'll find that in John 1.42. So there's Peter, James, and John. I, I, I think it's interesting he put them in that order, though. James, Cephas, John. Because after Hebrews, guess what letter you read? James. Two from Cephas, called Peter. Three from John. One, two, three. And those books primarily are to, as we read, when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen, that's Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision. That's why James says to the twelve tribes, James 1, verse 2. Now that doesn't mean that we can't read that. I mean... Isn't it fun reading somebody else's mail? Well, you get to do it legitimately by reading James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. But you recognize that's their mail. You can get some things out of there instructionally, devotionally, spiritually, but doctrinally, you better hang your hat with Paul. Because that's the one God chose. And that's where people, unfortunately, cut themselves. That eternal security of Paul. Whoa, man, I'll take that over Old Testament any time. I mean, the Old Testament, yeah, if a man lived righteously, he could ask for health and wealth and justice on his enemies. That's not a New Testament idea. I'll take eternal security, spiritual circumstances, name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'll take the birth, the new birth of Jesus Christ any, any, over anything in the Old Testament. I'll take that trade any day. But that's when we come to our Bible and we keep that foundation. Now, all of it generally makes sense. It makes no sense if you don't have that foundation. And this is why these people will limit themselves to a small set of fundamentals. They call themselves fundamentalists. And if you listen to them for three months, you're going to hear all they're going to teach you. That's it. And they'll just rehash that over and over and over and over. And if you ask them a question outside of the fundamentals, they don't got an answer. They'll run to Greek and Hebrew and change to English because they don't know what it's dealing with. And that's why they don't rightly divide the word of truth properly. So that dispensation, that is so vital. When a person starts with the training wheels, time period, good starter... But as we grow, we recognize the covenants, and the covenants can overlap. And then it makes sense, and then we our standard is the Apostle Paul. So this is biblical dispensations. Okay, so let's go and pray. Lord, I do pray and ask you to help us to uh, understand this, un understand your words, so that when we uh, read and understand the Bible, that we can assimilate it into our spiritual life, and it has value and it's profitability, and we can draw closer to Thee and begin to understand Your words so that we can apply them properly to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we'll be dismissed with that.